Tampa Bay's business address is Money Talk 1010 AM and available on HD at 99.5 HD2. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Money Talk 1010 AM, Tampa Bay's business address. The views and opinions expressed on the following show are those of Morgan Streetman and are not those of Beasley Media Group, this station, its management, or other hosts or advertisers. On Money Talk 1010 AM, it's the Morgan Streetman Show. Morgan and Roxanne Wilder are discussing everything from world, national, and local issues to information from the unknown. And since Morgan's an attorney, there'll probably be a little something from the law. Now, here are Morgan Streetman and Roxanne Wilder. Well, hello there. You're all warmed up, Morgan. Oh, yeah. An hour before with the Sarge to get you ready to tackle the day. Been going strong. Mm-hmm. Pat George is here. Hello. I'm Roxanne Wilder. <laughs> and Morgan is keeping us up to speed on everything going on in the world, nationally and locally. We're going to get to it all. Yeah, we've got some interesting stuff for folks today. Particularly, we want to. got a, a big segment to do on the Tommy Robinson release from last week. Because mm-hmm. that's one we've been covering a lot on this show. And it's one that I think is... You know, it's really important to to those of us that are interested in the ideals of freedom, particularly freedom of the press and freedom of speech, um, because it really it really zeroes in on those kind of issues. And and it's in a neighboring country in Britain, you know, which we would expect would be pretty much like us, you would think, you know, free and respecting uh, human rights, civil rights, uh, the right to, to freedom of speech, etc. But that was not the case. But anyway, we're going to get into that in our second segment, tell you all about that. So if you've been following that story, and we've got some clips for you, uh, and we're going to tell you about what his incarceration was like and other things, because, you know, it's pretty disturbing, and we want to make sure you have a full understanding of what was going on there. Before we get into all this, I mean, first of all, let me just say, if you want to give us a call, please do so. If you've got an opinion on any of these stories, or you want to have, have an opportunity to say something on the air, as long as it's you know, family friendly. Mm-hmm. We'd love to hear from you at 888-404-1010. Keep the cursing to a minimum or Pat's just going to dump you. That's right. You know, it's funny. You brought up the Tommy Robinson over the weekend. I had somebody that wanted to know if you were going to update that today. Yeah. Was so that why you good. called me on Saturday? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, I was at, listen, I was out at, I, I was out at Cabbage Key having a cheeseburger in paradise. Only on by boat. The only way you can get there. Oh, beautiful place. Beautiful. Yeah. You've been, right? I've been there. Yeah. Neat place. <laughs> I tell you, that's a tasty cheeseburger. When you've been out on the water, mm-hmm. have you been rocks? I have not. Okay, okay. Well, you got to swing through there sometime. Okay. But when you've been out on the water all morning, there's really, you know, nothing to eat, too much, mm-hmm. chips and, and beer. And you get there and you, i got to have one of them cheeseburgers. And I'll tell you what, hits the spot. Mick Jagger's been there. Jimmy has he? Buffett. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's a, very, it's a place where oh, Jimmy it's... Buffett wrote the Cheeseburger in Paradise song. No, it isn't. Yeah. In Cabbage yeah. Key. Cabbage oh, Key. Yeah. And it's just, you, you, like Pat says, you can only get there by boat. So big, okay. boats, big expensive boats go there too. Yeah, it's, I bet. it's very you know. Yeah, you got to have money to hang out there. I guess I was Ooh. riding along with someone else. Me Ooh. too. I had no money. I was <laughs> happy to be there. <laughs> Pat made it. If there's he a nice boat there. involved, it's it's got to be a friend of mine because because mm-hmm. you know it's like I was telling him I got this really nice twelve foot John boat guys and they all gave a good laugh at that. You right, know, like you guys. No are friends with boats are the best. Friends with boats. Mm-hmm. And I, you know what? I'm just a I'm a I'm a lakes and rivers kind of a guy. You know. I don't need the big, big waves and sharks and things like that. It's just, I just keep it. Keep we it. did. We were down on, uh, we went around the bay with Bobby, Bobby Rich from Q105. Oh, yeah. We went out on his boat yesterday. Oh, Bob. Bobby's mm-hmm. got a boat, huh? Mm-hmm. No wonder they he's call part him of a, Mr. He's Rich. got a boat club. Okay. Yes. Okay. He's a member in a boat club. And that was fun. Just a, you know, nice, soothing ride. Then up the river a little bit. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, we have a beautiful, I mean, a lot of uh, water features, beautiful things to go out there and see and experience. And and I will say, if you haven't done Cabbage Key, it's worth doing. It's a, it's really kind of a throwback to another time almost. I did decide, though, I think I'm done with boating until it gets cool again. Yeah, it is powerful <laughs> hot out there. Not fun. Yeah, I mean. It, I mean, the boating was, but I mean, just the, the heat. Uh-uh. It's, it no. takes it out. I had to take a nap when I got back, mm-hmm. you know. It, it wasn't the beers that I drank, No, sure. that, uh, that could have been a little <laughs> bit of it. Well, you got to enjoy yourself. You deserved it, your birthday weekend. Yes, thank you. Yes, I, I feel I did deserve it. I've earned it, and uh, and I did enjoy it. So, you know, we had a story. We want to take a quick look back before we get into some of our other stories. And I think it was last week that I called attention to, it may have been two weeks ago, but I called attention to uh, a telephone call that James Clapper had actually made to Anderson Cooper on CNN 
uh, on Saturday, which I so I think it was Saturday, you know, plus a couple of days ago that this occurred. May have been a couple of weeks ago. But anyway, that's not particularly important. What was important, because this really caught my eye, was that Clapper sort of threw President Obama under the bus. And it was it was something that had never happened before. So whenever they change, you know, what their story is or they they start to reveal something that maybe hasn't been revealed before, because I watch so much media and pay attention to so much, I can kind of see when the story shifts a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's what hit me right there is, whoa, this is a big shift because this has never happened before where they've admitted that Obama was involved in the decision making, but they did even more than that. Now you can feel that shift. You can sense that shift, but can all of the regular, us regular viewers? I don't know. I don't, you you know, one would hope so, but I mean, the media is very hard to, to, you know, to understand because they do, they, they, they keep their propaganda coming. So you've really got to read them with a critical eye and, and watch them with a critical eye. Mm-hmm. And so it's things like this that, you know, when you're doing it with a critical eye that really jump out at you. And and so what I did was I went and I found this audio because it, it made a, a couple of news articles. And that's what we were talking about. But the audio was not particularly easy, interestingly enough, to find on the Internet. I mean, you can find a lot of audio involving Clapper and Anderson Cooper and CNN, but you can't find this little clip very easily. But you got to hear what Clapper said. If it weren't for President Obama, we might not have done the intelligence community assessment that we did that set off a whole sequence of events which are still unfolding today, notably Special Counsel Mueller's investigation. President Obama... Uh, is responsible for that, and it was he who tasked us to do that intelligence community assessment uh, in the first place. Okay, I mean, did you miss mm-hmm. that? It's President Obama. We never would have done this but for President Obama. That's what he said. Now, during President Obama's term, James Clapper was the DNI, that's the Director of National Intelligence. That is, in theory, the top intelligence executive for our entire government. Mm-hmm is the DNI. It's the one that's over all the agencies. The and one that's he reports over, to the president. And he reports directly to the president. And, you know, just kind of out of the blue, I mean, they've never even admitted that Obama knew about this or was involved. And remember, because we were diving into those stroke page text mm-hmm. messages where they were saying, this comes straight from the White House. He wants to know everything that we're doing. And that's how we were proving that Obama knew about this scheme, this Russian witch hunt scheme that they cooked up, this insurance policy. But now Clapper's coming out basically saying it was all Obama's idea. I mean, to me, and I said this, you know, it's like the rats running off the sinking ship, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Clapper starts pointing the finger at Obama, he must know that the heat is getting really close to him. Right. Because he's trying to say, wait, no, no, it's not me. I was just following orders. I just, I just, he, it was all him. And so that, to me, was really meaningful. And and I don't think (laughs) – I know that the media didn't make a big deal about it, but I also don't think that there was any accident there that that got done. I mean, it was almost like, you know, kind of a message to Obama to be careful. Now, I'm not sure what he'd be careful of, but, I mean, they don't just let you say whatever you want. I don't know if you've noticed this on CNN. Mm -hmm. You know, if you start saying something on CNN that they don't want you to say, they cut you off, and we've got – you know. We can find you dozens of examples of that occurring. They've even cut off reporters. Exactly. They've cut they their just, own reporters. Exactly. They just cut a lady off. Of Maria Bartiromo had Helen Cheatman on, who started talking about the truth about you know J.P. Morgan Chase and da- Jamie Dimon, and they went to an emergency commercial break, an emergency commercial break. And when they returned, she was, she was gone. gone. <laughs> Bye-bye. They had just started the interview. So they don't mess around. If they don't want you to say something, they cut you off. Mm-hmm. They get you off the air. Mm-hmm. So Clapper. Well, this, doesn't, this isn't in line with our angle to this story. Bye-bye. Right. <laughs> so Clapper was, you know, he was really laying down the gauntlet a little bit. And, and I just don't know what all that, all that means on the backstory. But I do find it very interesting. And I particularly find it interesting that we have confirmation now from Obama's top intelligence official, that Obama is the one that initiated the Russia investigation into Trump. That's a bombshell. That's that's some of the biggest news that we've had about the Russia investigation because the truth is finally starting to come out. The truth is seeping out bit by bit as the ship is sinking, apparently. And, and I'm just glad that we finally have some truth. We don't have to wonder anymore. We don't have to 
We don't have to look at the implications of certain text messages and what they might mean. So what you're saying, Morgan, is that a president who's in office shouldn't be investigating, shouldn't be wiretapping, shouldn't be putting these these feelers out to the person who's running for to take their position? That's not supposed to happen? Absolutely not. <laughs> right. You're not supposed to take the Justice Department and make it an arm of your political party, make it an arm of the Democrat Party, which is what they did. And it's unbelievable. So I think this is a sort of a bellwether statement, you know, coming out from Clapper. You know, the weather is changing here. Things are changing. Something big is coming down the pike, and I surely hope so. And I hope it's that the truth is finally going to come out, and maybe some people are going to be held accountable for that truth. Wouldn't that be a Wouldn't that be a novel idea? We well, you know we got a great local interest story we got to tell you about because this is one you won't hear on the mainstream media. And yet it happened just this weekend over in Titusville, Florida. Uh, really interesting story because they were having a little event over there, and it was called the Peace in the City event. And, well, let's just say it took a turn uh, away from peace, took a strong turn away from peace. But luckily, there was a bystander there who had a concealed weapons permit and was able to become involved. So we'll fill you in on the details on that story when we come back on the Morgan Streetman Show. And then we're going to get into the whole Tommy Robinson thing. And we've got some clips that you're really going to want to hear. We've got the judge. We've got Tommy. We'll bring it to you when we come back. Welcome back to the Morgan Streetman Show. Roxanne Wilder, Pat George. We're here for you today. If you want to be part of the show, 888-404-1010. And Morgan, you were bringing us up to speed on somewhat of a local story in Titusville. And this is a armed bystander who actually saved the day. Yeah, yeah. Over in Titusville, Brevard County, Florida. It's over near Melbourne area. Um, They were actually having an event at a park. It was for a back-to-school event, but it was called Peace in the City. And they're basically trying to bring down the level of violence in the community, kind of like, you know, some of the issues we talked about uh, earlier with Sarge relating to Chicago. So we're having an event to say kind of like, can't we all get along and, and not, you know, have violence? And so specifically at this event, they did not want to have violence. Anyway, apparently somebody was still able to get themselves into a fist fight. That person went away mad, came back with a gun, and just started opening fire on the crowd. Now, it doesn't sound like that person – it's unclear because he didn't hit anybody. So we don't really know if he was trying to shoot people or if he was just he was shooting, shooting up, up in, in the, the air. air or what was going on. But a bystander who had a concealed weapons permit pulled out his concealed carry and shot the shooter and actually got him – apparently in the head and the shooter's now in the hospital with life-threatening injuries but it prevented what could have been a much bigger tragedy and you can see i mean they got video of this because the dj was there it made me think of you pat george and he whipped out the phone on video and i mean you could see kids running everywhere and families running and people were freaking out as as you would be if somebody came up to a picnic and started shooting mm-hmm. um, but so you know here we go here's an example of how somebody with a concealed Permit, a private citizen, not a police officer, saved the day. And who's also obviously trained to use that handgun. Yeah. And and so, you know, when they tell you that guns only have negative outcomes and only cause violence, you know what? Guns can also save people. Guns, good guys can use guns for good things against bad guys. And we don't hear enough about those kind of stories. We only hear, the only kind of story you're ever going to hear about is things like the Parkland shooting. And the mainstream media is going to totally ignore Stories like this. But you know what? If you pay attention and you look around, you'll see these stories, these kind of stories, pretty regularly, particularly here in the state of Florida where we've got a highly armed population. You'll see this kind of thing happen pretty regularly, but you got to look for it because it's not going to run on CNN and it's not going to be in the headlines anywhere. So, Mm-mm. Not at all. Well, speaking of headlines, I, this was a big one for me last week was the release of Tommy Robinson that just kind of happened, I would sort of say, out of the blue. On uh, Wednesday morning, we knew that there was an appeal that was in progress or was being looked at, Mm -hmm. and we weren't sure exactly what was going to happen. And then without a whole lot of fanfare on Wednesday morning of last week, which, of course, they run about seven hours ahead of us in London. So they're, you know, by the time it's Wednesday morning here, it's Wednesday evening there Mm -hmm. or late afternoon. But in their Wednesday morning time frame, they had a court case and the judge came out. And, and you had to love these English judges because they're so kind of understated. Um, and you listen to the to the ruling and it was a little bit longer. I edited it down to try to just get to the part that was that was the good part about this exact issue here, which was where he was arrested 
outside of Leeds Crown Court. Um, and, you know, the judge all makes it sound very, I mean, you can't even tell who won when you listen to the judge, except for the, the very end of it. Just want to make one quick mention, Morgan, before we hear that from the judge. I feel like with this Tommy Robinson story, it hasn't really gotten legs until after he's been out of jail and he's got sort of the gross stories about what happened to mm. him in jail. Mm-hmm. Is that what we look for? Do we look for the clicks so you get the gross headline? I don't know. Ter- because that's when I feel like it's turned more of a mainstream story is after he's been released. Well, you know, the, the thing is, there are not a lot of people that have been talking about the Tommy mm-hmm. Robinson story. And there was even in the UK in Britain, there was like a gag order in place where they really weren't supposed to be talking about it. Now, they started kind of quasi violating that. Uh, I noticed as time went on, and I think it was because there was so much information in the public domain outside of the UK that at that point the gag, the effectiveness of the gag order is kind of moot. What they would call it's moot. It means it doesn't really matter anymore uh, because you know this information's out there, and anyone can access you know any site in the world on the internet. So it doesn't matter that the UK press isn't talking about it. So I think um, you know they kind of bailed on that a little bit. But but the mainstream media did not plug in on this story. And I tell you, it, a lot of people were trying to get this story to Trump's attention uh, so that we could get maybe the ambassador to try to do something about that. And that apparently was somewhat effective. Um, but, you know, of course, this story, I will tell you, Rox, has been our biggest draw when we've podcasted on YouTube. We've gotten the most views on the Tommy Robinson issues. And why? I think it's because nobody else is talking about Mm -hmm. it. Nobody Mm -hmm. else is talking about it. So now let's hear what the judge had to say on Wednesday of last week. Uh, The appellant Stephen Yaxley Lennon was committed to prison for 13 months for contempt of court at Leeds Crown Court on the 25th of May 2018. Uh, For the reasons given in the judgment which uh, we now hand down, we grant the extension of time in respect of the finding of contempt in Leeds Crown Court and allow the appeal against that finding for the detailed reasons set out in the judgment, uh, essentially because uh, the process was flawed. We direct that the matter be remitted for a rehearing before the Recorder of London sitting at the Central Criminal Court as soon as reasonably possible. In the meantime, the appellant will be released from custody. All right. That was it. The appellate will be released from mm-hmm. custody. And Tommy was free. I love the way he dealt with it. Essentially, the process was flawed. Essentially, it was flawed. You mean when they when they arrested him, didn't even tell him what he was charged with, uh, didn't let him have his own lawyer, pulled him in front of the judge in a secret proceeding in a kangaroo court, uh, tried him again on charges that nobody even knows exactly what he was tried for, Convicted him allegedly, which I don't know how you can do that the same day the offense occurred and still give someone due process, um, and then jailed him all in the same day. The process was flawed. The, pro- oh, the process was flawed. Now, you got to love the English understatement there. You know what I'm saying? Now, let's hear what Tommy Robinson, because he did a great interview with Tucker Carlson. He's done a few others, and I really wanted to key in on, on I'll tell you this, Tommy speaks, he's a, he's a working class English guy, and he speaks with a very thick accent. Mm-hmm. And it can be somewhat difficult to understand him. So I, I tried to get parts of his statement that were the easiest for us to understand. But first, let's listen to what he has to say about why he wound up in jail in the first place. There was a court case going on where 29 people were in court for gang raping up to 100 young children. Now, I stood outside the court and I I, I spoke and all I done was read a BBC News article, a BBC News article that is still online now for millions of people to see. Now, and I was taken and everyone would have watched the video. They said for a breach of the peace, they transported me to a police custody and then my solicitor contacted the police custody. Then they emailed my solicitor, which my solicitor has this email saying I was being released. Then they took me in a van back to the court through the back door. They put me up before a judge and media reports have said that I pled guilty. These are at no point was I even asked whether I was guilty or not guilty. I was not even told, and I still, to this point now, have not been told and do not know what it is I'm deemed to have done wrong. In a British court of law for a fair trial for anyone, they have to understand what it is they're being accused of. Contempt of court. That's all I've been told. 
what, what contempt of court? I, I was fully aware outside that court. I made sure to point out that these men are innocent until proven guilty. I said alleged. I was non-confrontational. There is no, the judges, and I know the law, the judges have no power to issue reporting restrictions on anybody, on any information that is already in the public domain. I was taken and whisked away, and what we've seen this week is the highest judge in our, our country has completely condemned this as flawed, completely criticised the, the handling of this case, the kangaroo court style it was to imprison me. Yeah, exactly. The process was completely flawed. And, you know, I thought it was interesting. He was out there reading a BBC News article. And it's still online. That's online. So what, what in the world was it that he was doing that was so bad? You could get that information anywhere. And he said the guys are innocent until proven get guilty, et cetera. Now, what this resulted in um, was him being imprisoned. And uh, initially he was imprisoned in a sort of a normal UK prison, one that wasn't highly Muslim. But they very quickly moved him over to a, a prison that was 70 plus percent Muslim, the population, highly Muslim. And it, it is known as one of Europe's or excuse me, the UK's uh, toughest prisons because of the high Muslim component. A lot of people convert to Islam when they go to prison there as a survival tool because they need the protection of the Muslims. Um, and while he was there, he was kept in solitary confinement 23 hours a day, basically, and you know, he said that mentally was extremely tough on him because he, he literally had no contact with anyone. And that was done for security reasons. But as he said, you know, there was no security problem in the court and the prison that he was in originally. So they moved him to a Muslim prison. And now all of a sudden they've got major security issues there. Well, as people, as the prisoners would file in and out of the prison because they put him on the ground floor, which actually is a little bit below ground. So his window was basically at ground level. And as they would file in and out these mostly Muslim prisoners, particularly when they would be going to the mosque, which was right across the yard from his cell, they would throw excrement, spit, whatever they could find that was nasty to throw in his window at him and so he had to keep his window closed almost the whole time he said it was really hot it was a sweltering heat and it's his opinion that all of this was done to try and mentally destroy him and he actually says it was mental abuse so it's unbelievable we're going to tell you a little bit more about that when we come back on the morgan treatment show Welcome back to the Morgan Streetman Show. We've been keeping an eye on the Tommy Robinson story since he was put in jail, since this all began, and now hearing from him after the fact. Morgan, I thought it was really interesting to hear his personal take on really he wasn't doing much of anything at all to yeah. get thrown in jail. It's kind of crazy. Right. I mean, imagine yourself in this position because, you know, England is not that much different than America. No. What's that, Pat George? What are you doing over there? You playing games? Oh, that's the gremlins in the computer. The gremlins. I knew you were going to blame it on the gremlins again. Mm -hmm. Are they the ones that ate all the cookies, Those too? Are the same gremlins that Mason has in his computer. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you, this Tommy Robinson thing, I mean, it, it ought to frighten you if you're a person who believes in freedom. Because Tommy Robinson, you know, he's been bringing attention to these Muslim gangs in, in Britain. And they're a lot further along, by mm -hmm. the way, in Britain in terms of... Um, Islamizing the society, and we've talked about that civil, civilization jihad issue, and that's where they basically come in and try to take over a country, kind, and that's kind of what they've done in the UK. And there's videos to support that. If you're interested in that, you can get out on YouTube and you can find videos about people walking through certain areas of town and the type of reception that they get. But Stephen Yaxley Lennon, that's the same guy as Tommy Robinson. If you caught that, that's what the judge said at the beginning. And of course, you know, one of the things I thought was interesting was after this whole, you know, kangaroo court and the guy's in prison for stating a political opinion, after all of this, he gets released. And what does the UK, we ought to maybe change the name from the UK independent, maybe we ought to call him the dependent, because they seem to be so dependent on the government story that it's, it's hard to believe. But they come out with a story saying um, Tommy Robinson's been released, and here is the here are the powerful international far right network that's behind him, <laughs> and 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 basically, then they say, uh, "Look, it's um, Steve Bannon from Breitbart," and then they list a whole bunch of other people that you'll never have heard of. There is no powerful network, by the way, behind Tommy Robinson. Tommy Robinson's just a guy. 
He was out there doing his own Facebook Live on his cell phone outside the court. He's not part of some some network. All he does is he's a normal person. He sees what's happening to his country, England, and he doesn't like it one bit. And like you heard him say in that quote, the trial there was a trial of about 30 people, all of them were Muslims, who had taken advantage of young British girls numbering in the hundreds over a long period of time, years and years. And this goes on, what I'm told, a lot in England. And, you know, I can I get where Tommy's coming from, but I just think it's amazing that now the media's out, and now all of a sudden Tommy Robinson's got this this powerful network behind him. Look, if you've got a powerful network behind him, like Hillary Clinton's got behind her, you don't spend a day in jail. You don't get thrown in jail on trumped-up charges after a kangaroo court. You can actually break the law, and nobody will ever come after you for it. You can steal money from Haiti. You can take the money that people gave you for the earthquake and spend it on your daughter's wedding if you're Hillary Clinton, and nothing will ever happen to you. But this guy supposedly has some powerful network behind him that's obviously doing a lot to protect him. I don't think so. This is pretty, in my opinion, it's pretty thinly veiled propaganda coming out of these U.K., uh, papers, particularly the Independent, you know, and I think what's interesting when you ask Tommy Robinson, what was the real reason that he was in jail? And he'll tell us very directly what it was in this country. Anyone who speaks about Islam, you can believe him a complete liberal. The minute you mention criticize Islam, you are deemed and attacked by everybody. You get that? That's it. Oh, you're in trouble. Street. In Britain, when you criticize Islam, you become an enemy of the state, and you are attacked by everybody. That's what's really going on so, here. So so is it really kind of opposite rather than, oh, he has a network behind him? Because obviously the BBC printed the very article that he was reading from, mm-hmm. but they're not enforcing anything against the BBC because they're, they are a big, powerful entity. But, okay, let's find this one individual who is publicly going out and trying to get the word out about what he feels is... Right. Is an atrocity. Well, it, it you know, it just it's amazing to me that the story isn't the fact that finally justice has been done in this country, that a man who was jailed for without due process, without a lawyer, without even knowing the charges against him, without being able to plead or, or have discovery of the evidence, uh, without any of that. This man was jailed for two months. And I thought it was really interesting because in his interview, he said, you know, it took them between two and three hours to arrest me, try me, convict me, and ship me to jail. But then it took two months for me to get the highest court in the land to look at it. Then after they looked at it, it took another two weeks for them to come up with their judgment and put down the ruling, which happened last Wednesday. So you got three hours to put somebody into prison and two and a half to three months to get them out. I got a problem with that. I got a real problem with that, particularly when once they're gotten out, it's because, you know, the, the highest judge in the law says the process was flawed, meaning they didn't follow the rules. There was no due process there. That's illegal. They broke the law. They put this guy in jail for nothing. Over here, there'd be a civil rights case coming after this, you know, uh, saying you're going to have to pay him some money for wrongful imprisonment. They won't have that over there. But. I tell you, it's a real shame, and it's something that I think here in America, we gotta we got to look at what's going on in England, because we do not want that to happen here. And I hope we could all agree on that. I know that we can't, but I would like to think that thinking people could all agree on the idea that we want to maintain the freedoms that have given us this great republic, the freedoms of speech, the freedoms of the press. That's what Tommy Robinson was doing And that's why he spent two months in solitary confinement. And oh, by the way, all during that time, apparently, he was he would report that they were randomly unlocking his doors. And of course, you know, if you watch enough movies, that's what happens in prison when the guards all turn their heads the other way. They unlock your cell door and then Bubba comes down with a shiv or whatever. And, and, you know, I guess it wouldn't be Bubba. I guess it would be Ahmed comes down with the shiv and makes mincemeat of you. And apparently he said that happened a number of times where they would unlock his door almost as a setup. Where is he now? Right now he's in Tenerife with his family. He went on a a vacation for a couple of weeks, well-deserved. So he survived. He survived. Now, he lost 40 pounds. I mean, he's he's a shadow of his former self. He's not a huge guy to begin with, 
Um, but he's lost 40 pounds, and he really looked gaunt when he came out of there. He said they only gave him a tin of tuna and a piece of bread every day. And, you know, he made a comment, which I thought was really um, impactful. And he said, you know, I was supposed to be in Her Majesty's prison system, not in Guantanamo Bay. Mm. You know, and, and look, he's an English citizen. Just think about it. This could happen to you maybe here someday in the future if we don't stay on top of this stuff. It's a big deal. So, all right, let's talk about another big deal. And that is. Who's going to be the Speaker of the House for the Republicans after the elections this year? What do you think? Mm. Well, I think I can tell you this. I think as of last week, the chances for Jim Jordan just went through the roof because Jim Jordan was at uh, this Trump rally and apparently they it was unplanned and apparently they'd never even met before. Jim Jordan has never even met President Trump before this rally. And President Trump uh, yells out his name, and the crowd, boy, the crowd goes wild for Jim Jordan. And then you can see the evolution. President Trump, I think, was just going to mention him, but then he sees how excited everybody got, so he calls him up on stage. He says, get up here. And uh, and then you got to hear what Jim Jordan has to say because, boy, what a class act guy he is. Check this out. Jim Jordan, how great is he? How great is he? Hey, come here, Jim. Come here, come here. President's a little taller than me. Um, in, thank you. Thank you. Think about this: in 18 months, regulations reduced, taxes lowered, Gorsuch on the court, the economy growing at a record rate, unemployment at its lowest in 20 years, Kavanaugh's on deck on the court. We're out of that crazy Iran deal. The, the embassy is going to Jerusalem and the hostages have been returned from North Korea. That's what's happened under the president's leadership. Thank you very much. He's certainly a good speaker. Oh, yeah. He would make great, great speaker. Defender. He's been what courage? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know. What a guy. I tell you what, we were talking about that, about people, you know, in, in positions of leadership or in the media and how they could be so self-centered and self-focused in the way that they deliver themselves. And now you got a guy like a Jim Jordan and he gets up there and he could have done a lot of things. You know, there, the crowd was chanting Speaker of the House, Speaker of the House. I don't know if you heard that. What makes him so great? Because he's a truth teller. He's a straightforward guy, and he doesn't appear to be there for his own interest. He's trying to do good government for the American people. You know, he's been right on top of all this Russia stuff, the Clinton email stuff. I mean, he's been one of the main guys in Congress during these hearings. Of course, they're hearings, and they're limited in what they can actually do. You know, Congress doesn't seem – they don't have a lot of teeth, so to speak. So now he's actually going to be competing, though, for Speaker of the House, which I think is great. I think Jim Jordan would make a great speaker. He's part of that Freedom Caucus with Mark Meadows and the others. And I think he would be a great speaker for a great direction for this country. Now, um, it's going to be it's going to be a tough race uh, that he's in because he's going up against Kevin McCarthy, who's been there a long time and got a lot of power. And I think that President Trump was kind of leaning towards McCarthy. I think this this right here, this event that occurred at the Trump rally, I think probably is going to have turned his mind and he's going to be in favor of Jim Jordan because Jim just got up there and he just sang Trump's praises. Right. I mean, and and I think there's some praises to be sung and he sung praises about regulations being reduced, taxes being lowered, unemployment at its lowest rate in 20 years and so on and so forth. And just kind of had a litany. He didn't sit, get up there and talk about what a great job he's done or anything about himself, he, he gave the president praise. And, you know, I don't know if you remember this phrase that Ronald Reagan used to, to have, and, and he basically said there's no limit to how far a man can go if he doesn't care who gets the credit. I love that. And, yeah, and, and that, to me, is that Jim Jordan mindset right there. 
He's not in it for himself. He's not self-aggrandizing. He's up there. He's doing it for the country. And I think, I tell you, he's probably one of my favorite people. You know, I love Louis Gohmert. I, I, love, I love Matt Gates. I love Ron DeSantis. There's a lot of guys that I love in this group. Jim Jordan is, is probably maybe even the best. Um, he's just such a, a, a strong leader. And, um, and I, and I hope he gets... That a lot because you like Louis. I like Louis. I do like Louis. But he's a little bit more of a bomb thrower. Jordan stays a little bit more above the fray, let's say. But, um, you know, I personally think Jim Jordan's going to make a great Speaker of the House. I think getting to meet Trump in this way, by the way, he gave Trump a big hug and Trump gave him a big hug. And, uh, you know, it was really, it was a nice moment. And if you interested in the Trump rallies and stuff, I'd say go out there and pull the clip of when Jim Jordan gets up and speaks because uh, it's really a moving moment. It's something to see. All right, we're going to go out there when we come back, tell you about aliens and Nazis. Welcome back to the Morgan Streetman Show. It's time to go out there with Morgan Streetman, and we're really sticking to our out there theme. We're going space. we got a good one for you. Mm-hmm. Now, this is one I bet you haven't heard about, but it's true. Okay, this happened back on July 25th, so about what, about a week and maybe a couple of days ago. Uh, there was uh, what has been called a meteor. Of course, we don't know exactly what this was, but a meteor exploded above a U.S. airbase that's located in Greenland. And the airbase is called Thule, the Thule airbase. Now, this caught my eye, of course, Thule. And I said, hmm, that's an interesting name for a U.S. airbase because I happen to know that that's also a name that was used um, as the capital of Hyperborea, mm-hmm. which was a, an ancient sort of Atlantis type of island that supposedly existed in the very far north of the globe and from which came the Nordic peoples. And they actually came down and supposedly had a war with Egypt. And this is all in Greek mythology and stuff. And so you can look this stuff up and learn about that if you want to. But there was a, a again, let's remember, this is an alleged meteor that exploded above the Thule Air Force Base, apparently about 26 miles above, and it hit with a force of 2.3 kilotons. Now, probably most of us don't know exactly what that means in a practical perspective, so I tried to pull some kind of a historical example, and I found this thing called the Halifax Explosion that happened in 1917 up in Nova Scotia, and the blast was 2.9 kilotons, so a little bit stronger. But at that time, it was the largest man-made explosion ever until the development of nuclear weapons. So that was a pretty serious explosion. It destroyed nearly all the structures within an 800 mile, that's about a half mile, uh, 800 meter, excuse me, about a half mile radius of the explosion, snapped trees, bent iron rails, demolished buildings, uh, created a tsunami that washed vessels up on the land um, and scattered fragments of the actual ship that exploded for miles and miles. So it's a real serious explosion that took place there. Um, and apparently that that meteor was traveling at 55,000 miles per hour, or Mach 74. That's mm. pretty fast. 15 miles a second. So it was just, I mean, can you... <laughs> I'm trying to picture that, but you can't picture that. You can't. I mean, Mm. that's like doing the quarter mile in a millisecond or Mm. something. And where did this explode? In the air? It exploded about 24 miles up in the air above this Thule Air Base that's in Greenland. So I went back and kind of looked into this Thule Air Base, and I found they built that in 1953, Project uh, Blue, I think it was Blue Jay. And uh, why they named it Thule is is kind of a question in and of itself, because Right at that same time, you know, there were many things going on, including the importation of Nazi scientists, spies, government representatives into the United States. And they brought with them a lot of the occult mythology that the Nazis had ascribed to. And and there was a very famous society in Nazi Germany called the Thule Society. And, you know, its, its symbol was a swastika. It was actually the precursor of the Nazis. The Thule Society actually sponsored the Nazi Party and got it going. The the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Okay, that's what the Nazi Party was actually called. Um, But it sponsored them in Munich. And and, and the list of former members, I mean, it had a lot of high-level Nazis in it, okay? Adolf Hitler was big in it. And he apparently, because this was an occult society, so... They apparently got together and tried to work magic together and channel 
channel contact with beings from other planets, uh, beings who were in the center of the earth, they believed, who were supermen. I mean, this is all stuff the Nazis were into, right? And it all goes under this Thule society. <laughs> and then we start importing their scientists because Nats NASA, which is basically um, the national – Socialists of America, in so many words, because all of our original rocket scientists were imported Nazis, and that's something called Operation Paperclip. I don't know if you've heard that, but the people that were involved in the Thule Society, besides Hitler, included Rudolf Hess. He was the deputy Führer. Um, also, a guy named Hans Frank, who was Hitler's personal lawyer and uh, was a was a high up uh, person in the Nazi Party. Uh, also, Alfred Rosenberg. Um, who was also very high up in the Nazi party. And, I mean, the list just goes on and on um, of Nazis that were involved in the Thule Society and this belief that they were contacting the supermen. There's some split in mankind where super people went down into the earth. This is what they kind of believed and wound up digging a tunnel from Thule and Hyperborea all the way to under, I know, Roxanne's giving me the funniest look now. Like, where is this going, Streetman? But this is what they really believed. I mean, I, I hope you just get, that's what I'm trying to get across here. This is what they believed. And and by the way, we're naming our, our military bases after this idea, you know, after we kind of absorbed their culture. So they believe that they dug a tunnel all the way underneath the Himalayas. And you remember when you were out in, um, out in the Far East mm -hmm. and you saw a bunch of swastikas and stuff. And you said, well, these are everywhere out right. there. Right. At, at the, when we went to the Grand Buddha. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. It looks like one. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you've got. You've got the connection there. That's where the swastika came from. It didn't, it didn't come necessarily from, from Germany first. It was the symbol that was used to signify that we're dealing with the super people who went from Thule in Hyperborea, dug a tunnel through the earth, and now live under the Himalayan mountains. Now, if that's not out there, I mean, if that isn't out there, I don't. Uh, that's about the best I can do for you, <laughs> folks, is to go out there. Now, if you really want to have some fun with some of this stuff, and you go, gosh, Morgan. Can I interrupt one moment? Sure. With a certain word you said, Hyperborea. Yeah, that's Is that, that any relation to the other word that you introduced me to? Koala bora. Um, <laughs> is there any? Is there any relation? No, the that cola kind of, super deep borehole. Cola super. Yes, no. they kind of sound similar, right? <laughs> they do. They do kind of sound similar. <laughs> Other than being uh, both uh, very far north, because the cola super right. deep borehole is uh -huh. like right, I think, right inside the Arctic Circle in Siberia. Mm -hmm. um, but it, maybe it's just right outside. I'm not 100 percent sure offhand. But yeah, other than that, I don't know that they're connected, but you know, there is that idea of trying to tunnel down into the earth and yes. maybe we'll find mm -hmm. maybe we'll find that the earth is hollow or there's some civilization in there. Now I'm not I'm not suggesting this is actually true. What I'm trying to do is explain this is what the Nazis actually believed. And it's interesting to me that our own space program, our own military, and I didn't quite get to the space program because I wanted to tell you they just named uh their New Horizons target, NASA just named it Ultima Thule, which that's actually the name of the capital, Ultima Thule. And, of course, the NASA person said, I've never even heard of this name before, ever. And that just, frankly, didn't strike me as very legitimate, given the fact that it's all over these various air bases. Now, all right, we're going to have to cut this off because we've gone too deep, and now we've got to try to bring mm. it back. I would just say this. That Thule base up there in Greenland, that's our first warning base for nuclear missile launches. thats We built that. That's near the Arctic Circle. It is essentially between the USSR and America and the U.S. We built that to give us early warning on missile systems. So, I don't know. He's cracking all the codes. Maybe this was a meteor. Maybe it was a demonstration of a hypersonic missile. I don't know. We'll see you next week on the Morgan Streetman Show. The views and opinions expressed on the preceding program were those of Morgan Streetman and are not those of Beasley Media Group, this station, its management, or other hosts or advertisers. Yeah, that was Campbell a little bit. Hello. business address is Money Talk 1010 AM and available on HD at 99.5 HD2. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Money Talk 1010 AM, Tampa Bay's business address.